Hi, and welcome to another great adventure at uh, the New York City Category Theory Seminar. Today, we're going to hear from Samantha Jarvis, who is a student at the Graduate Center, and she's going to talk about language as an enriched category. Take it away. Hi, so thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Samantha Jarvis. I'm a third year at the Graduate Center. Um, my advisor is John Carrilla, who is in the audience. And today's talk is uh, based on a paper by uh, Bradley, uh, who's also in the audience, I believe, Lassipoulos and Carrilla called Enriched Category Theory of Language from Syntax to Semantics. And it's also, I also wanna shout out before I get started, um, the book by uh, David Spivak and Brendan Fong called Seven Sketches in Compositionality. Their uh, second chapter of that book is a really good introduction to these sorts of ideas. The reverse arrow button. Um, I don't get it either. Well, how you turn to how you get a co-host or host? Oh, uh, <laughs> I thought that was because of uh, the technical issues and getting set up. I was like, oh, is there some? Uh, some, some way to fix the technical issues, but regardless. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with uh, just the overview of the talk, which is we're going to first talk about enriching over the unit interval. Then we'll talk a little bit about language and then we will put it all together. So uh, to get started, I'm going to present a definition that should hopefully be uh, very familiar to everyone in the category theory seminar. And that's the definition of a small category. Um, you know, the set of objects, uh, for every two objects, a set of morphisms that have identity and associative compositionality. And the motivating question of enriched category theory is what if instead of having a set of morphisms between every two objects, we had some other object in some other category? And now we would want our home objects to behave nicely, by which I mean that we, they should do something that's analogous to having compositionality and having identity. And if they do, we get what's called an enriched category. So we're gonna start by thinking about enriching over pre-orders. So a pre-order is just a set along with a reflexive and transitive relation. And we can easily think of a pre-order as being a thin category where for any two elements in our set, we have an arrow from X to Y, if and only if X is less than or equal to Y. So in this way, you could imagine, and what I was hoping to be able to do was be able to draw a nice little example of a directed graph from all of these uh, elements. And so then uh, your compositionality and your identities come from transitivity and reflexivity, respectively. And so the other part of our definition that we're going to need to talk about what sort of categories you can enrich over is the definition of a monoid which a monoid is a set along with an associative binary operation, the monoidal product, which has a unit. And unsurprisingly, if the monoidal product is commutative, we call the monoid commutative. And now when we have a pre-order that also has a monoid structure, where the pre-order and the monoid structures uh, play well together, in the sense that if X is less than or equal to X prime and Y is less than or equal to Y prime, then the monoidal product of X and Y is less than or equal to the monoidal product of X prime and Y prime. We call that a commutative monoidal preorder. And it turns out that commutative monoidal preorders will be the exact right place to find our uh, HOM objects. And this is another place I wanted to make a slight annotation. We could write um, V opening parentheses X, Y to be the set of arrows between X and Y that if those are elements in these, uh, this community of monoidal preorder. And of course, because uh, there can only be one um, arrow between any two uh, objects in this set, then VXY would either be a singleton or it would be empty. So uh, unsurprisingly, as we're going to be uh, enriching over the unit interval, the unit interval is a community of monoidal preorder with respect to the usual ordering of the real numbers where multiplication is your monoidal product. So with all of this in mind, we can define what a V enriched category is. It consists of a set of objects. And then for every two objects, 
a V HOM object, which is just an element of your commutative monoidal preorder that satisfy um, that one is less than or equal to the V HOM object of any object with itself. And then also this uh, compositionality rule. So if we're thinking about zero one, a zero one category will consist of a set of objects and then a function that for every pair of objects gives you a number in the unit interval, such that that function for x, every pair of x in itself is giving you one and the monoidal product, um, we, we have this compositionality with the multiplication. So, and then we can also think about uh, if a commutative monoidal preorder is closed, if get, given any two elements of the monoidal preorder, there's an element called the internal HOM, such that the monoidal product of X and Y is less than or equal to Z, if and only if X is less than or equal to the internal HOM of Y and Z. So we have um, equality of the sets um, of arrows between uh, the monoidal product of X and Y and Z, and then that of X and the internal hum of Y and Z. Where we note again that both the right-hand side and the left-hand side are either one-point sets or empty. So uh, zero one is closed with its internal hum given by truncated division, um, where the internal hum of A and B is B over A if B is less than A and it's one otherwise. And so just something important to keep in mind is that we have um, both a monoidal product, which in zero one is multiplication and a categorical product, which in zero one is just the minimum of the two elements. And these are not the same. Um, and then we also have an internal hum. So the advantage of having a closed commutative monoidal preorder is that we can make uh, a closed commutative monoidal preorder V into a category enriched over itself by replacing this emptier one point set VXY with the internal hum. And now uh, the argument for this uh, is that one is less than or equal to the internal hum of X with itself, if and only if uh, the monoidal product of one and X is less than or equal to X, which is uh, immediately true because one is the unit for the monoidal product and uh, less than or equal to is reflexive. And then the other condition that we need to satisfy, we get just by looking at uh, the, the um, definition of internal home. So the internal home of something of Y with Z is always less than or equal to itself. So then we can break this apart as the internal home of Y with the monoidal uh, of Y and Z uh, with the monoidal, uh, monoidal product with Y, excuse me, is less than or equal to Z. And doing something similar with X and Y, we eventually get what we want, which is that the monoidal product of the internal homes of X and Y and Y and Z is less than or equal to the internal home of X and Z. This is a little bit of a crash course in um, enriched category theory. And now we're going to uh, move on briefly to talk about language. So what's interesting about language is that language is compositional, which is to say that you can combine two expressions to make a longer expression. That is kind of the core of how we talk to each other is we combine words to make longer expressions. Um, but how do we think about what an expression means in like a rigorous sense? So we should pick a word and try to figure out what that word means. So if we fixate on the word red, what does the word red mean? And we can think of red as being the ideal of all expressions that contain red. So it contains red fire truck, blood red, bright red, as you can read, the workers and peasants red army, red and blue French flag, and so on and so forth. And if we extend an expression, we can get more precision. The ideal of all extensions of the workers and peasants red army is necessarily smaller and contained in the ideal for red. We're refining the meaning in a sense. But 
continuations of expressions don't necessarily occur with the same probability. If I start a sentence with, yesterday I went to Trader Joe's and I bought, you would reasonably expect the sentence to end with um, frozen meals, a can of chickpeas and some shallots, cat food, et cetera. But you wouldn't expect me to continue with a Ford F-150 unless your Trader Joe's is also a car dealership, in which case this toy example is not very applicable to you. But it's grammatically permissible for me to say I went to Trader Joe's and I bought a Ford F-150. It's just very unlikely. So the fact that it's grammatically permissible but unlikely is a behavior we'd like our model of language to somehow capture. That there are phrases and expressions that can occur that are very unlikely to occur. So that is to say that the distribution of extensions of an expression contributes to the expression's meaning. So the, there's a typo on the first uh, line of this slide. So it should say the distribution of extensions of an expression contributes to an expression meaning. And similarly, you can use extensions of expressions to figure out what something means. So if you had no idea what Trader Joe's is, but if you knew that all of the likely extensions of the sentence of the phrase, yesterday I went to Trader Joe's and I bought were food items, you could reasonably deduce that Trader Joe's is a grocery store. If you also had the ideal continuations of the same phrase, but for Whole Foods, and you could observe that the two are highly similar, you could reasonably deduce that Whole Foods is also a grocery store. Um, And this is somewhat similar to, uh, I don't know a ton about behavioral psychology, but this is actually somewhat similar to how people learn language when they're very young, is you somehow learn to recognize all things with this sort of attribute are cats in a sense. So in fact, the distributional hypothesis in linguistics says that expressions with similar distributions have similar meanings. The words red and crimson have similar distributions and similar meanings. Red and Trader Joe's, in contrast, very different distributions and very different meanings. Um, and by distributions, we mean um, distributions of possible continuations. So how likely it is that red is extended by other expressions versus how likely it is that Trader Joe's is extended by those same expressions. I, I would imagine the word red is used more, much more than crimson. I mean, the distribution might be similar, but in other words, how high the distribution is or something like that. No, I mean, crimson or? That's an I would imagine that it would, might depend a little bit on what, if you were to imagine that you had like some fixed corpus that you were taking these distributions from, it would probably depend on what the corpus was. Because I could imagine maybe you pick some, you know, very, like Beowulf or something, some translation of Beowulf and you decide, okay, I'm going to, train some model of the English language on Beowulf. And maybe there's some very arcane uh, words in that that would seem to occur with great frequency. Okay, okay. But I guess one point I was gonna say that seems the point was that even if they occur with different frequencies, we normalize them in comparative distribution, see if they have similar meanings. Is yes. that so? Yeah, exactly. If you see that like red, it's, it's a little hard to come up with a good toy example, but if you see that uh, red is maybe extended by fire truck very, very frequently, and then crimson is also extended by fire truck very, very frequently. And you observe this not just for fire truck, but for a whole wide class of expressions, then you're probably getting um, two relatively similar ideas. So, sounds good. Go ahead. That's the way I think about it. Um, and so uh, the categorical perspective um, allows us to easily combine the compositional and distributional structures in that uh, we can think of having some category L whose elements are sets of words in a language oh, and whose morphisms are given by continuation. If that's a little... Um, or, or you could also think of maybe you have sets of words in uh, a corpus and whose morphisms are given by continuations. So for instance, again, you could imagine this being a directed graph. And once again, I wish I could draw a directed graph where um, 
you have an arrow from the word red to red fire truck because red fire truck extends red. And then, of course, instead of considering an expression X, we can identify it via the Yoneda embedding with its representable functor, um, which we call uh, HX, which is all of the things that uh, continue X. And in this case, uh, HX of Y is the one point set if Y continues X and is empty otherwise. So if we let X be red, then uh, the value of H of red on red fire truck is, well, one point set is the singleton, but on Bluebird, it's empty because Bluebird doesn't contain red as a sub, sub phrase. And so we can also think about the co sheaf category uh, of L, which is uh, which has as objects functors from L to set, and as morphisms the natural transformations of functors. And in general, for any small category, um, the category of co sheaves is better behaved than your original category in the sense that it's going to be complete, co-complete, and Cartesian close. So it'll have all limits, all co-limits, and all exponentials. Uh, it's actually an example of a uh, what's called an elementary topos, uh, which we're not going to really get into topos theory here. But having all limits and co-limits and exponentials means we have a way of building new expressions from old expressions, from our previously existing cache of expressions. Uh, the product of co sheaves is a co sheaf which we compute point-wise. So if we were to take the products of the co sheaves for blue and red, we get another co sheaf which maps an expression in L to the set product of the co sheaf for blue evaluated on that expression and that for red evaluated on that expression. So if our expression C contains blue, then as we've talked about, um, the co sheaf for blue evaluated at C is a singleton point, it's a singleton set, and if it does not contain blue, then it's empty. And similarly for H of red. So calculating what the um, co sheaf of this product does on a given expression actually just comes down to considering products of sets. And we see that um, this product is the singleton set if blue is, con is contained in C and if red is contained in C. So if C extends both blue and red, and it's uh, empty otherwise. So this coincides exactly with logical and, and it's giving us a way to say blue and red. So for instance, if C, we put in the red and blue French flag, then H, um, then this product of co is evaluated on the red and blue French flag would be the singleton set. But if we just put in red fire truck, it would be empty. And co-products, which are also computed point-wise, uh, will coincide with the logical or. So this perspective is good in that it gives us a compositionality and a way of combining expressions that makes sense. But we'd also like to accommodate for distribution. So in this category that we've defined so far, the arrow from red to red fire truck has the exact same weight as the arrow from red to red idea. And we'd presumably like to weight these arrows. So expressions that appear more often have a heavier weight. So we can say that if I start a sentence with, today I went to Trader Joe's and I bought, it's much more likely that I'm going to finish that with shallots than it is with a Ford F-150. So we want to think about making our category L into an enriched category. So we're going to say that the syntax category is the zero one category whose objects are expressions in the language. And there's a little typo there. And whose uh, zero one objects are defined by uh, L of X, Y is the probability that the expression Y extends the expression X. So, uh, pi of red fire truck given X is exactly the conditional probability that red fire truck extends red. Sorry, that if X is red. And so, of course, if Y does not extend X, then the probability of Y 
given x is zero. So for instance, as I was saying, we could have, you know, the probability that these are reversed. Yes, these are reversed. Uh, each of those should be swapped. The probability of blue bird given blue could be like 0 0.03, blue idea given blue could be 10 to the minus seventh and so on and so forth. And so again, if we were to imagine that this is uh, a category of directed graph, Oh, sorry, a category represented by a directed graph, you could just imagine drawing little weights on each of the arrows. So, and we call this enriched category L the syntax category because it encodes what goes with what. And now we can pass to um, the enriched category of co precedes on L. In this enriched setting, we can again combine expressions using enriched limits, co-limits, and internal homes. And of course, to make sense of enriched co uh, in order to do this passing to enriched co we should know what an enriched functor is. So if two categories are enriched over 0, 1, then an enriched functor sends an object to in C to an object in D such that um, the uh, home object uh, in C is less than or equal to the home object in D of uh, the images of these objects under the functor. And since 0, 1 is closed, it is enriched over itself, as we previously showed. So we can take D to be equal to 0, 1 to get enriched co precedes as functors from C to 0, 1, i.e., so an enriched co precedes will satisfy. Um, that C of X, Y is less than or equal to the internal hom of F of X and F of Y, where this internal hom is truncated division. So then, of course, we have uh, analogous uh, representable co precedes, where if we have some expression X and L, then H of X, uh, which is just the set of things that continue. Um, excuse me. And then h of x is uh, a zero one functor. So for instance, um, if x is red, then h of red on some expression c is just going to be the probability that c extends red. And so we have also Sorry, my notes appear to be a little bit out of order. But we have also to make the category of uh, co precedes into a zero one enriched category, we need a, a HOM object in zero one. So we need some HOM object of every two um, co precedes. And in general, the construction that we want is called an end, which is a special type of limit in our, enrich our enriching category. And when our enriching category is uh, zero one, the end is simply the infimum. So it's the infimum of over all expressions in L of the um, internal hom of f of x and g of x of our co precedes evaluated on that expression. So we also have a zero one version of the Yoneda lemma, which says exactly what you would expect it to if you're familiar with the enriched version of the Yoneda lemma. It says that for any object X in any zero one category L and any zero one co precedes from F, F from L to zero one, the um, home object in L hat of H of X and F is exactly F of X. And if you are already familiar with the statement of the Yonet dilemma for enriched categories, this is exactly the appropriate statement if um, you just take zero, one to be V. But the zero, one Yonet dilemma in particular has a simple proof, since all of the things we're thinking about are just numbers in zero, one. F of X is a number in zero, one, and the internal HOM is also a number in zero, one. So proving this version of the Yonet dilemma just comes down to showing that these two numbers are equal.
So to show this, we want to fix some x in the language category. And then note that for any uh, expression in the language category or any category over 0, 1, um, this infimum is going to be less than or equal to the, in, to the uh, internal hom of h of x evaluated d and f of d. So when d is equal to x, we specifically have that this infimum is less than or equal to f of x. Because of course, h of x, sorry, that x in the second line should be a one. Um, so, so it should read uh, the infimum is less than or equal to h of x uh, evaluated on itself, f of x, which is the internal hom of one and f of x, which is just going to be f of x itself. So this infimum is less than or equal to f of x. And then for the reverse direction, we have by the definition of zero one functor that L of X C is going to be less than or equal to the internal hom of F of X and F of C. And of course, L of X C is just exactly H X uh, of C. And then by the definition of the internal hom, we get that H X of C times F of X is less than or equal to F of C. So then f of x is less than or equal to the internal hom of, f of, of h of x c and f of c. And since this holds for any uh, expression c in our category, we have the other containment, or we have the other inequality. And so then as you would express, as you would expect, we get the two kind of immediate corollaries of the Yonet dilemma. We get that the um, hom object between y and x is exactly the hom object in the co sheaves between h of x and h of y for all objects. And then we get that the uh, assignment of x to its representable co sheaf defines an enriched uh, functor which embeds uh, the opposite category of the language category as an enriched subcategory of the um, co sheaf. So H of X is going to be a natural candidate for the meaning of X because it contains information about the expressions containing X. And it further accounts for how likely it is that those expressions extend X. So the embedding of L op into L hat assigns a text X to its meaning H of X, H to the X. And we can notice also that this embedding uh, reverses arrows. So if there's an arrow from X to Y, so Y extends X with weight A, for instance, red extends red fire, a uh, red fire truck extends red with weight 0 0.03, then there's going to be a arrow from H of Y to H of X, where H of red fire truck extends uh, there's an arrow from H of red fire truck to H of red. And how we can think about this is that red fire truck is an extension of red in the syntax category, in that it um, literally contains red as an embedding it is, is inside of it. H of red, however, is the meaning of red, which is the various contexts in which red might appear, and thus is an extension of, is literally bigger than the meaning of red fire truck. Continuing an expression, which in a sense could add more detail to the expression, restricts the context that that expression can appear in. Okay, so since uh, L hat is complete and co-complete, we have constructions like product and co-product. So similar to the unenriched case, this allows us to combine meanings and create new expressions from our corpus of expressions. And these combinations behave like weighted logic. The enriched co-product acts like an enriched version of AND. Um, in addition to being a nicely concrete application of enriched category theory, this perspective sheds light on the behavior of language models. So I think that was where I wanted to leave it. So are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much. One second. Um, everybody? Thank you. 
Anyways, any questions? And again, sorry about the technical difficulties. You were really deprived some excellent doodles of directed graphs. I, I have a, a few questions. Um, somehow this all depends on, uh, you know, you, your adjectives come before the noun. So, you know, red car, red apple. What would happen if we talked about a verb, you know, and we had something coming before it? In other words, would it would it make a difference? In other words, if you extend something further, then you're you're putting on more adjectives or something. So, so uh, to my understanding, the extension is just about whether it contains like an extension of red just has to contain be a phrase that contains red uh -huh. somewhere within it. So it doesn't have to necessarily like follow red. Okay, good. It just, it's, it's easiest to visualize with like adjectives. And I'm wondering if this has anything to do with what Bob Kaki, Koki is doing. He's also getting into meanings of words. Is there any connection at all? Uh, I'm not super familiar with his work, but I will. <laughs> I'm very happy to look it up, give it a read, and no. give my not, I'm not very familiar with it, but the little bit I do know is that, you know, Bob is looking more as, as grammar and type parts of speech and things like that. Yeah, I, 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 I thought, yeah. uh, well, Larry can talk more about this. I, I thought that was one <laughs> I mean, that's uh, Jim Lambeck also had the pre-groups. That was more about yeah. the structure of the of the sentences. But Bob is getting into something about meaning also. But all, all of this work is is um, just, in a sense understanding it as a probability probability space, but it's not actually starting with the idea of any kind of structure that that you do have in like Kuka's work and, and Lambeck and and um, similar kind of stuff. So it's this would this is in a way basically about the probability structure that you get from a bag of words model mm -hmm. as far as i understand it so there, there isn't there isn't any presumption that anything was generated by any structure in any kind of way it's actually just the data is the only thing that she's working with okay. yeah. no and it's been shown i don't i don't know a ton about large language modeling but it's been shown that language models can learn um complicated grammatical structure without it being given to them that, that's a little bit of a that's a very contentious point is it? I mean, I, yeah this is completely contentious yeah oh. if you start reading about it i mean i kind of work on that subject and and so um what it counts as learning is is um in some ways yes and in some ways no and so it's 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 not like it's not like an open and shut thing that you could just sort of like say that oh yeah then i i fully redact <laughs> I guess I did have a, a, a broader question that uh, you said that what you presented is sort of a, an extension and based on um, some other uh, work you cited, uh, including a bunch of people who are also here. And mm -hmm. so just sort of in terms of the vision of the research program, um, the fact that there's not a lot of the structure means that uh, it is actually very computational in the sense that it's easy to compute and extract, right? The, the, sort of the rawness of this is exactly something that you can throw a machine at a corpus and just, you know, or a farm at a corpus and, and get some data out of. Mm -hmm. So are there any ideas of applications or what, like, suppose I threw, you know, you know, I don't know, like, you know, 200 texts from the internet archive into a machine that built this category, right? That, that seems like something one could do. Uh, what would, um, what would then what do one do with this? Well, um, language modeling, possibly, although I'm now maybe a little bit reluctant to well, get out beyond my skis on that. Well, I guess more specifically what you're doing here, let's say to try to, you know, it sounds like one obvious thing we try to look at, you know, meanings you extracted for words in the sense you were. Yeah. I, can, 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 can I j jump in with a comment? I, I, I think in some ways, um, th these kind of ideas are a response to some language modeling 
that's being done um, successfully. So you, you have some of these large language models um, like GPT-3 that learn uh, how to continue texts. So in some sense, they learn this language category of what goes with what and what probabilities. And in fact, notice, and there's a good point here is they usually just learn the right, the probability distribution on right ideals, continuations, which is uh, something you were kind of asking about. But, um, <clears throat> but then in order to do that, uh, you have to have a lot, you know, in order to, to be able to, then, then once these models are trained to learn continuations, you can give them new prefixes and, and then sample from the distribution of continuations. And, and so what you end up getting is this thing where you give a beginning of a story and then the, the, the model produces the, you know, continues the story. And it does so in this, in this really amazing and coherent way that, that involves a lot of understanding about the meanings of, of what's being, being said. Um, you, you know, if you, if you start talking about, a, if, you, if, you, if you start a story about a dog, it, it will know things like, you know, that dogs bark and that they're, you know, pets and things like this. So I think the question is, is then a mathematical one, which is, if you have a set of probability distributions on right ideals in some set of sequences, um, then, then you inherently have some sort of semantic knowledge, um, you know, that, that there's some, some knowledge of, uh, of the world there. You know that, um, you know, Trader Joe's is a, is a, is a store that, that, that typically sells food. So the question then is mathematical. How, where, where is that semantic knowledge? Um, if, you, if you're giving, how do you pass from probability distributions on ideals to, to the semantic knowledge, which is sort of implicitly learned from having these, um, these distributions? And I think here's, here's, a, here's a place to look which is in this category of co pre uh, So, so uh, the, thanks. So, so you're sort of saying that um, some of the idea here is you look at these existing things that are sort of overtly uh, successful in that, uh, you know, whatever one thinks they're actually doing, you know, they certainly <laughs> are, are doing impressive things just on the face of it. And then um, you try to get, uh, give a sort of more principled mathematical account uh, or clean mathematical account of, what's happening so that then you could say, you know, what would it mean to then sort of extract information back out of these models? And, um, and, and maybe that would be sort of an application there is uh, you could take the sort of approach and then say, now let's take our trained GPT model on some corpus and see what it can do uh, besides continuing the story about the dog. That's right. So if you have access to the internal states uh, of the model, that in principle you have access to the representable co pre sheaves. So, so then then maybe you can combine those co pre sheaves and 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 get some information about you know use the internal hom to to ask questions about implication. You know if this text is true, is this other text also true? Um, you know or 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 create more complex um, semantic concepts, higher semantic com concepts from from these given texts. Oh, so th that, wonder, that's an idea. Uh, the, uh, it might be interesting to look at the following. Uh, I'll let the objects be expressions uh, accounting for syntax. And then I'll form a category in which the morphisms uh, correspond to uh, extensions of the expression according to some syntax. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, extending an expression with a propositional phrase. Uh, or extending an expression by a, uh, uh, say, a verb phrase. And then uh, use the idea of the zero one category to assign uh, probabilities 
uh, to uh, to each morphism, and that way, uh, you know, uh, 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 re, uh, 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 lifting the 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 model you're proposing, your you know, the model you've developed, to a model in which uh, no probability, which which takes into account a uh, uh, a, uh, a grammatical model of a language. So, so I, I, so I think, I think that's um, a little. That's sort of like more halfway in between what what this work Sam, Samantha was talking about, and and the the work of um, Bob C C Cook uh, is, is yeah. doing, so, where, so, where he, so this, he's sort of what this we're not doing is is attempting to learn the grammar, but we may observe, we may observe, uh, uh, you know. Uh, semantic relations, uh, the semantics pertaining to, let's say, the uh, interpretations of nouns, verbs, and adjectives, mm -hmm. you know, as meanings, rather yeah, I, than tokens. I mean, I think, I think that I think that sounds like a very interesting uh and it, very interesting language model i think the current work if you want to think of it as a response to you know that existing that these existing large language models that are just trained on continuations without any grammatical input or any world knowledge input they're just trained to learn how to continue expressions um from samples drawn from from existing corpora, then, um, and thinking of this work as sort of a mathematical response to that, then, then those aren't trained with grammars. So these models that Samantha talked about don't have any, any grammars as input. Um, and I think it's an interesting observation um, of that these models tend to produce grammatically correct continuations um, or you know as grammatically correct as humans produce um, without ever having had any grammar as input um, and then you know I, I think I, I, as Larry pointed out you know the, there's some question about you know whether or not you can get those grammars out again um, but uh, uh, but it, they seem to produce grammatically correct expressions without any grammatical input. I think it's interesting. Well, there, there might be a phenomenon relating to uh, you know, Steven Pinker's uh, work reported in Words and Rules, in which there he calls a micro-grammar that uh, relates to, uh, to, to the, 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 the grammar that uh, that uh, uh, responds to or expresses uh, uh, the, the, the meanings of words, you know, in addition to the the uh, the, the grammatical structure of the expressions. Uh, this this that the grammar somehow comes up through randomness is that is that like does that impinge on Chomsky's thing that it's not built in you know it's more built into the math rather than built into human minds or something like that uh, that it's rather shocking that the grammar shows up I mean it, well, in my experience I'll say actually playing uh with these things and um if people haven't played with AI dungeon I don't know how many people here have have heard of it um it's adorable they, they trained a GPT model on a whole bunch of like uh, role-playing games. And so it's an interactive role-playing game and you just type whatever you want, like, you know, go West like you would, but you can also say whatever you want and it'll respond and incorporate it into its vision of the world. And um, sometimes you do get perverse loops that are like bad and they actually relate to the Chomsky question in a way about contextness in that uh, it, 
sort of breaks because it hits cycles and so on, and it doesn't know how to break out of them because it, it, seemed, it, it doesn't have a notion of a stack or whatever sort of built into it. So when you get grammatically bad things, uh, it, it, it tends to like recur as though you were moving without a stack. Well, you can notice the lack of that broader sense of meaning uh, in the bad responses you get from it. So, Larry, uh, Larry it seems like he's agitated. Uh, I, 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 sort of I have a, a general kind of question about the whole uh, modeling that you're doing. So, supposing we took, um, let's say, a, um, a a trigram model of English. So that means a Markov process whose points were th words three in a row in English. And the probability is whether one could follow another. So like it's, one of them might be the red car and the next one might be red car is, and there would be a certain probability from the first to the second. And you do this for all of triples of English words. And then you start taking a random walk on this with very high probability, it would look like a very good English sentence. So that means if you, if you sampled from this kind of thing, or if you sampled from a very good probabilistic context-free grammar, I mean, you have a grammar, you have a, a some generative process. It would be with very high probability making nice English sentences. They might not be as as um, intelligent as uh, GPT three, but for everything you did, everything you talked about, everything you said would have applied because you didn't. You only use the words probability and um, co-presheaf and and all of the categorical machinery up until like almost the last slide. So everything that's a, a probabilistic model could definitely apply to. Um, everything you said could apply to, to a decent model of, of a fragment of English. So what you were doing had, it seemed like it had nothing exactly to do with, um, with neural net models of, of English. It's just actually from a good, um, a, a good sample, a, a good probabilistic sample of English. So, and then you could take all of the stuff that you're, you're talking about, all the stuff that um, you plan to do, and you could really run it uh, and, and play around with, with something, you know, on a computer, like immediately and see what you get. And if you would get something like, my question is, would you be able to reconstruct um, the grammar or the structure in which, it, the, the, which you started in any kind of reasonable way? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know, but that's a, a really uh, interesting place to look, I think, potentially. I think I think we're going to reconstruct okay. the Jabberwocky, <laughs> which is which is the opposite of what you're doing. I mean, there they're 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 picking up grammar randomly. I mean, they're following the grammar, but not using the right words. But, Larry, I can I res respond to 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 what you, what you said. I mean, in in some sense, if if you just take any any language, uh, you know, any formal language out of a set of sequences right. of from some alphabet. Um, and then you have a probability, you put a probability distribution on that, right. then, um, then you can um, create this language model. That's what, that's all can, I'm saying. Yeah. That's and then, and then you can pass to, to, to these co pre sheaves and so on. Right. I, and so, um, and, and so the, you know that's a very interesting question like what what how how would i'm not even sure how you would have a reconstruction theorem that's what know? i'm asking you to do <laughs> yeah yeah you, you I, mean, you would, the theorem. <laughs> I mean in some sense if i have the probability distribution on on all the expressions then i i, I actually have all the expressions so i know the language no, 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 no. If, that, um, if you if you have all the probabilities, you still have to like say in English that um, a sentence has a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and the noun phrase typically comes first. So I'm asking you to, to tell me things about the structure that's not immediately from the probability distribution on the on the on the text. So I'd like to know if you could reconstruct any notion of structure from just the categorical uh, machinery that you built. Okay, so I I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. It's 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 a it's an interesting project, and I'm not sure how like um, what shape and a universal answer would 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 have. But in ad hoc examples, you, you know, you, you could kind of um, do it. But 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 one thing you brought up is that it's sort of independent of whether you're using a neural network model or some other model. Um, is that right? Am I right about well, that? I mean, well, 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 you are in the in the sense that if you just want to have a model for continuations, yeah. um, 
you, you know, do, do you need that to be computed by a neural network or could it That's be right. computed by something else? Right. And, right. and in, in, in some sense, I think this work points to, um, points to other possible models that are not necessarily these large transformers as, as, a, as possibly having more appealing features. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. They, 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 the, the, you have more access to the, to the co-presheets. So for mm -hmm. example, um, there was another work by Bradley who's here and Velisopoulos who is a, a co-author on this work that Samantha was talking about. Um, uh, they, they wrote a paper about modeling with densities and there, you see, you, you kind of get some of these co pre sheaf operations on, on the densities. So like you could, um, you, you know, you can take convex combinations of densities to, 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 to sort of um, create like weighted co-products. Um, and, you know, as far as I know, you can't just take the, you know, the internal parameters for GPT-3 for a couple of expressions and then average those. Uh, and, and expect that to have any meaningful, um, have any any semantic meaning, like 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 the co-presheet. So so I think um, so, so I think that's um, well. You, your your question made me think of that. For whatever it's worth, um, many of many of the models actually are, are trained not really by continuations, but the best way to, for many of them is to take a series of words and to mask out one of the ones that's in the middle, and have the model predict what what goes there, uh, and and so so that actually is a different kind of structure that that you might want to look at. Sure, sure, Bert. That's famously. a different structure. Yeah, you, you, yeah, Bert, it's a little that's different. a Bert kind of thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, since so, so it man mentions the. Uh... The, the, a model including that uh, a model that uh, that uh, that say begins with a formal language. A thought there is to accompany a uh, the grammar uh, by uh, probabilities on uh, instances of the rules of the grammar. Now a general or a rule will be, let's say a context-free rule says that uh, you know, uh, uh, a phrase of, of category A is formed by concatenating a phrase of category B and a phrase of category C. Oh, uh, then instantiate for all three, for all, for all, for all triples of phrases uh, with a category A, B, and C, a probability. I, 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 sorry. sorry, Seth, go, go, go. I, I'm sorry, I just want to stop the recording and uh, we can talk as long as we want. I just want, I don't want it to, to get too long. I also want to say next week is the last week of the meeting and Todd Trimble, Todd Trimble is going to be talking about category negations, roadblocks and de detours, whatever. You're all welcome. So I'm going to stop the recording now, but again, we can go on as long as you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Samantha, again for a beautiful talk. It was a great talk. Thank you.